so yeah, just I suppose to kick things off a bit. Um, hmm. I've been threatening to do a podcast show for ages, and yeah, and I managed. We did six in two thousand and sixteen. And then, uh, you know, the SNS started to explode and, and um, it just took a bit of a back seat. Um, and I recently uh, read an article about podcasting and stuff. And um, yeah. uh, one of the things they said was pod fade, which is most people have really good intentions of doing a podcast and they yeah. get to episode six. Yeah. And then <laughs> so I, I was one of the, uh, the numbers in pod fade. So so blank canvas. Um, yeah, really, uh, really pleased to say that you're sort of, you know, the first um, sort of business maverick, business leader that I'm going to be spending some time with interviewing for this show. I think Brilliant. my vision for this really has always been, um, you know, wanting to spend some time and, and have good conversations with, um, you know, sort of business leaders, global thought leaders, business mavericks that, you know, have just got experience that is slightly different to others mm -hmm. that can be brought into the business world to help all of us get through, um, you know, what's going on. I mean, even pre COVID-19, um, you know, things were tough out there. You know, a lot of businesses yeah. were dying, a lot of leaders were finding it hard to get cut through on change initiatives, speed of hyper disruption, industrial, um, uh, the industrial sort of fourth industrial revolution coming into play, different yeah. generations of workers being, uh, you know, in the office place at any one time. It was a real sort of um, moment in time. And then of course, COVID-19 hit us all. Um, mm. so, um, you know, through one lens, I've got more time to be doing stuff like this, which is great. But, but yeah. secondly, I think the topic of our show, uh, I think is really relevant and that's why I wanted it to be the first one for yeah. this reason. So yeah, I'm going to chat before the show and we're thinking that we were going to be talking about leadership and the importance of clarity and crisis, which yeah. I think is huge right now. So yeah, anyway. off, Rufus, um, name, game and uh, claim to fame, please. Okay, so um, hi, my name is <clears throat> Rufus McNeil. Um, my game is change management um, and leadership through change and transformation. My claim to fame um, is, I guess, uh, my background is military. So uh, I spent 21 years in the military and then made the transition into the civilian world and change management in the civilian world. Um, but I often draw on one particular thing I did in the military and I learned a lot of lessons through it. Um, and that was to drag a 200 ton hydroelectric turbine across Afghanistan in the face of the Taliban, and drag it up into the mountains to a remote lake to try and bring power to the Afghan people as part of a, a, a large initiative at that time to try and change the dynamic of, of the campaign in Afghanistan. Um, we look back now and you know, elements of that were successful, elements of it definitely weren't, um, but actually as, a, as an endeavor, that united a team um, and posed all kinds of interesting challenges that went all the way through to front pages on national newspapers and so on. Um, I think it definitely probably counts as a bit of claim to fame. So there you go. Cool. That's me. Cool. I think, um, you know, your experience as a sort of brigadier commander in, in Afghanistan, you know, probably taught you so many leadership traits that are now very relevant in business. Well, they were relevant in business before and, you know, very relevant now. So. If you think about a um, question for you, if we think about the backdrop of you know, some of the challenges of the current environment mm. that we're, in, we're in now with, with um, you know, the pandemic being global and us all being in lockdown, what kind of home truths do you think um, it's forcing businesses to confront now? It's a, it's a good question. A good word. Home truth is a good word, I think, because what's happening at the moment, I think, is that all businesses are going through a massive stress test. Um, they are, they're having all of their, their operating models, their culture, their ways of working fundamentally challenged. And that's exposing them, uh, is exposing uh, some of the, the, the fact, for example, that their teams don't really understand how their business is supposed to work. They're not entirely clear on their responsibilities. It's exposing um, challenges around the business culture and whether people are truly collaborative because you know, in this new environment where everybody's working as we are now at the end of a camera, if you haven't already established a collaborative way of working, you're going to quite quickly find teams fragmenting and dropping into silos. Um, and, and it's challenging leadership, um, which is, you know, an area that I'm naturally interested in. And it's testing whether um, some of the leadership models which are out there um, can really stand up to remote working and people under stress and people feeling uncomfortable. So I think it's challenging business in every respect. And, and what we're seeing, I think, is also um, 
at all of the things we would talk about as, as people who are involved in change. Um, because this is essentially change. A crisis is change. It's just an unanticipated one. And that's um, what we're seeing now. It's basically every business is having a change forced on it that it wasn't ready for and wasn't expecting. And all of those lessons we teach about how to manage change, taking the people with you, and particularly what we're talking about today, being clear, having clarity from leadership, um, are critical to managing change. And lots of businesses are not experienced at that. And therefore, the wheels are starting to come off in some places. Or people are just suffering unnecessary stress and discomfort from trying to manage a model that wasn't great in even more demanding circumstances. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting point. We, we've been talking a lot um, internally at SNS and with our clients just about, um, you know, COVID-19 has almost brought um, the way that uh, businesses need to operate from a digital perspective um, right into scope right now. So it's kind of ripped a band-aid off the future yeah. of work and the future of business uh, and the industrial way of working and mm. hierarchy way of structuring decisions and you know uh, analysis paralysis and death by business case and all this kind of slow decision making has just suddenly yeah. been ripped up and everyone's just got this kind of free pass to make lean decisions quickly mm. just to actually pivot into some sort of digital way of operating or some sort of remote way of operating and they've got to do it right now and it's it's just going to be interesting to see how things play out um once things <laughs> settle um into whatever is the new norm I mean, we it is, it. it's a huge step isn't it for some businesses and we know that sort of when challenged and in crisis many businesses retreat to what they know just as people do they take comfort in the things that they've done the most and the most familiar with and so some of the businesses that i'm working with i can see them retreating back to old processes which just don't work for this environment um, so if there's inefficiency out there in the decision making process, if it normally involves 10 sets of hands or 10 signatures, they're hanging on to that um, in the first instance because it's what they know. And it's just multiplying the inefficiency and slowing everything down even more. Um, some of them are very quick. Uh, and I suspect those are businesses that are already got something of an agile mindset and are used to pivoting fast um, because that's what their products do. But those bigger and slower organisations have a journey to go yet before they've really understood what this new environment is challenging them to do. Yeah. So if we say, um, for if we frame it sort of management 1.0 was kind of pre-19 mm. and then COVID-19, it's like, you know, <laughs> there you go, there. transformation, deal with it. Yeah. Uh, what kind of additional uh, sort of leadership challenges do you think remote working is bringing to the table yeah it's, it's interesting isn't it? i mean at, at its heart um leadership is is about presence and tone a lot of the time um and it, you know establishing that that sort of president that, that presence giving confidence by your actions and your words um and then setting a tone for the business that everybody follows this is our culture this is our ethos and so on that's a huge part of leadership that's so much easier to do in the room than it is over a screen um, partly because uh, you're relying on the, the force of character and presence to do it, and um, partly because it's about reading the room and being able to see how different people are responding to that and seeing who needs help with it and seeing who absolutely gets it. Um, so that element of leadership is made much more challenging by doing things over a screen. And, and particularly for those businesses that aren't even doing what we're doing now, which is at least seeing each other. There are lots of businesses that are still operating um, on conference calls just using phones. You don't get any of that. Um, so that element of leadership is, is tough. I think the other challenge um, is direction and a key part of, of leadership is, is being the one to set the direction. You don't tell everybody how to do their job, but you do tell them what the aim is and where we're trying to get to. Um, and I think going back to our previous point about the sort of stress test, this is proving to a number of businesses they haven't really worked that out. They haven't really worked out what the core direction of their business is. They haven't worked out why they're there. And um, this is bringing out all the creaks in that. And that's not natural for some leaders. They have to work at it. And some of them are now realizing they haven't got that. And they've got to get that message out there at the same time as they've got to manage the fact they can't directly talk to and influence the teams in an easy way. So I think those are the two big challenges, really, is setting that direction um, and making sure that you understand what it is for your business and what that means for your people. And then creating that leadership aura to, 
to drive it through. Is, is that why you think many companies are finding it so difficult because they're actually not prepared for a digital world? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it's partly they're not prepared for a digital world and they're not sort of comfortable with leading digitally. I think it's just also an accelerator for faults that were there anyway. So it's exposing leadership weaknesses in the round. All it's done is it's put um, the requirements on leadership, a much more severe set of requirements on leadership. Um, same, same problems, but at just a more extreme end. And if your leadership was already a little sort of um, either weak or inexperienced, then this is just going to expose it all the faster. Um, and, you know, I would say if you want to be really good in the leadership world, you need to go back to the principles of leadership in the round. You just need to remember those basics and then apply them in the digital world. But it is harder. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of the reason that it's hard is just the sheer pressure that some leaders are facing right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, depending on how big the companies are, you know, how much they've been affected uh, by COVID-19, which industry mm. they're in, you know, if you're in travel, yeah. high street, yeah. retail, hospitality, yeah. um, you know, as opposed to some of the other industries actually doing very well right now for, for, for reasons that, that we know. I suppose if we... Um, just, just on that point, though, I think it's really interesting, Pat, because ultimately leadership is about people, I, I would contend. It's fundamentally about people. And it is interesting to see there are some businesses which basically their business model is broken by this. You know, they involve moving people or physical interaction between people. Um, and so, that, you know, they can't, with their existing model, survive. But what they can do is look after their people. True. And it is interesting to see which businesses are and which businesses aren't. And that, for me, is a sign of leadership. So, I mean, it's, a, it's an aside point, but it is always interesting to test the, the measure of a, of a business by what it thinks of its people. And some businesses are definitely being um, shown to be fantastic in this crisis, and some are really being exposed. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I and mean, I've got quite a strong uh, premise around, you know, the, 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 the measure of a, a good leader is how you show up in the good and the bad times. Yeah, absolutely. And... Um, you know we're, we're all kind of going through some testing times now and it, mm. i think there are some businesses out there just not going to come back from this by the way they no. treat people now no. i totally understand that some businesses have to furlough i totally understand yeah absolutely have to cut costs but there has been a lot of uh, uh you know especially in the world of where we are with social media stuff that's mm. gone on you know certain airline yeah. above the yeah. line you look at the the message from that ceo that came out and you think that's all i need to know about that company's culture and actually yeah. as a customer I actually experienced that on your flights. And then yeah. there's another airline over in, the, in America that went, went above the line and said, we're a family, we're gonna get through this, we're gonna stay mm. tight. By the way, I'm still gonna pay your bonus from last year because that was your bonus that yeah. you were last year, this is this year. Yeah. And, uh, we're, we're, you know, and it, was the, it was the clarity in comms around, we're in a strong cast position, this is what we've done with the business, this is what we're doing with the business, mm. and this is what we're gonna do for you. Yeah. Um, this is what we expect. This is what we don't expect. And, um, you know, galvanizing that goodwill, not just in terms of the internal customer ecosystem, but, you know, online, you know, stuff like that goes viral. And, um, Absolutely. We, we always think about this and, and I've been thinking about it as a leader of, of SNS, which is, you know, it's, um, we have one of our key strategic drivers. We want to be a model organization where mm. executives in time will, will come and explore how we do things as we're an exemplar of, of how we operate. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and what we don't want is, you know, where there's, um, you know, um, evidence where we're not looking after our people during times like this, because it, it only takes one person to put something on glass door or a video somewhere. And, and you know, it's okay. ideal. But secondly, it's just the right thing to do. So and that's the key bit, isn't it? That's leadership it is, is about setting the right thing to do. And yes, it's about um, making compromises where you have to. But ultimately, a leader leads the people in the business. And a business that seems to, at the first sign of trouble, abandon its people yes. um, is not a business that's being led. Um, as simple as that. You can, you absolutely need to furlough people. You need to try and make sure the business survives so that in the long term, its people have a place to work. Mm. Uh, but I think there, are, there is a reckoning coming for a number of businesses which have shown that they really didn't think about their people at all in this process. And, and that's a crystallization of leadership for me. Yeah. You know? telling people what the future can hold and, and giving them some faith that there will be a future. And if your first act is to actually treat a number of your people as if they were a secondary input, um, you're failing manifestly in that. Yeah, big time. So 
if we think about um you know when when you're in when you're in battle in afghanistan rufus mm. and now the business leaders we feel like we're in battle a bit at the moment you know yeah like, absolutely a lot of variables not going with us right now yeah uh, um you know one of the things that we we can do is give that clarity to the people that we're leading to the market that we're showing up in um to the vision that we're trying to manifest and one of the key things that we agreed on when we spoke about before this um mm. this show or this podcast um interview and, and chat conversation was clarity being yeah. one of the first things that you can do so so question for you to talk to me mm. about what giving clarity in times like this requires from leaders and it'd be good to unpack that across you know clarity of purpose priority responsibility mm. message and then the behaviors behind it around following through yeah well let, let's go back to sort of basic leadership models and and, and leaders providing the, the kind of the why the what and the when um and that's ultimately what they need to give clarity on and you know I, sometimes i get a bit uncomfortable with the, the parallels of, of, of sort of military and business and um, particularly the sort of fighting the war angles but here in this kind of extreme change it's actually very apt um uh, what we're seeing is a new situation which you can't control um and or you, you you're not in charge of the virus in this case is driving the course of events it's making the calls and we're having to respond and we're having to do as much as we can to operate sensibly within that and that's very similar to a, a sort of a military environment and the kind of pressures you face in on operations um and so the clarity bit really is about recognizing that you've got a whole team of people who are there to do a job and they knew what the job was um in the previous world and all of a sudden their world has been turned upside down by events that are outside their control and things are changing their working environment is changing their um their ways of working are changing what they need to do is changing in some cases they may not even have a business uh, in the form that they thought they did and all of them now are, are uncertain. There's this massive uncertainty. And the leader's job is to bring some certainty back and to try in that environment to lay down a path for them that says, as a, as a group, as an organization, um, this is what we need to do. So that clarity starts off by saying, what's our purpose now? In the environment we're in, how does our purpose change? Is our purpose what it's always been? Um, or are we now doing something different? And you've seen that with some organizations that are fundamentally changing. Some of the organizations I used to work with in the logistics world, um, they are changing. Some of their businesses completely stopped. Uh, and in other areas, it's, it's mushroomed and, and, and grown as they suddenly support places like HMS Nightingale and, and support um, the supermarkets, which are now sort of employing more people than ever and so on. So um, it, the first thing a lead needs to do is say, what's our new purpose in this world? And are we all clear why we're here and what we're here to do? Uh, and you'd be amazed how important restating some of those basics are. And, and I think as leaders, we can sometimes forget um, because we're so close to the action. And often as leaders, we're the ones who get the information first and we hear it from the most senior sources. Uh, we forget that a whole load of people in our organization aren't getting that and they don't know some of these basics. You can't take it as read. They really understand what it is they're being asked to do. And so it, it's your job as a leader to restate that. And make sure everybody when they get on the screen first thing in the morning they know today my business is trying to do this and then within that the next question is okay i know where the business is going what am i doing um because that's changed uh, you know at the beginning of the week i was doing this or last month i was doing this now everything's up in the air i know what you want the business to do what do you want me to do where do i fit in so clarity of responsibility is really important here's your part in that being very clear with everybody each team, each individual, this is what I need you to do. And around that, but that, that's the start point for a leader. So somebody knows they've got something to hang on to now. Okay, I understand what my job is. Then helping potentially coach them through what that means if it's changed. Because for many people, that, that responsibility will be different. It will have changed slightly. And because it's different, people won't automatically be able to work out what it is that they need to do differently. So helping as a leader walk them through that, some will naturally respond to that very well. They are, um, you know, there are those who don't like to be given too many constraints and all they need to know is the direction and they've got it and they'll go. Um, there are lots of others who will find that more difficult and they want really clear guidelines. Um, and in this environment, you can't walk around the desks and have that sort of side chat to each member of the team. 
um, and have that discussion with them. So you're going to have to find another way of being clear with them, whether it's a one on one call or something else. So clarity of responsibility, really important. I think then clarity of priority. Um, back to, I think, a point you made earlier that this is the when, really. Leaders are struggling with a massive thing, new government advice, their customers are, uh, are changing, some customers are demanding more, other customers are saying, I'm, I'm finished, I'm going into lockdown, I can't work. Leaders have to be able to help everybody manage those multiple balls, and they have to be prepared to, to tell everybody which balls to let drop, and which balls under no circumstances can drop, must stay in the air. Um, so that explanation of, of this is what we're focusing on, and particularly with these distributed ways of working for businesses that aren't familiar with that. Just getting onto the computer in the morning and just working and, and getting into normal pattern of working is taking up 30% of people's effort. They're struggling just to get in the hang of that. The hang of that. So making sure that you focus the other 70% of the effort on the right thing so that when they really are motoring, they're motoring on the right stuff, not the wrong stuff, is, is really key. So priority Absolutely vital. I mean, it's always vital in business and it's often the thing that goes wrong, but it's even more vital now because everybody's got so much noise. And I think the final priority I'd stress is, is uh, sorry, the final um, clarity I'd stress is uh, clarity of message. So you've got those three things you need to do. You need to be clear on your purpose. You need to be clear on responsibilities and you need to be clear on priority. You've got to get those across in the simplest way possible. Um, so we're back to good old communications and how you tell people um, what it is you want them to do. And I think we've seen some fantastic examples at the moment of, of that. Um, I, I'm really impressed by a couple of the supermarkets and their CEOs who are absolutely out on the front foot. Um, they're sending emails to all of their customers. They're writing these absolutely really good, succinct letters saying, this is what my business is doing. This is what I'm trying to do for you as a customer. This is how I'm looking after my people. Very clear, marvelous examples. And then I think, you know, if we were honest, you could say there are other examples where some really important messages, maybe about social distancing and others, have been a little bit unclear. Um, and we can see the, the, the ripples that causes with everybody coming back with questions or not being sure what to do. Mm. So that clarity of message is really vital. So I think those are the four that would be my take. That's an interesting one because I, I think what you're referring to earlier was probably missing clarity around the do's and the don'ts around the, uh, you know, staying at home message. Absolutely. Yeah. We talk about that because that's quite it's quite direct, right? You know, yeah. the, it's like rules of the game, right? We're in yeah. a new we're in a post COVID nineteen game. These are the do's. Yeah. These are the don'ts. So, um, I, I recently got some some cut through with my team on that, where um, you know, we look at some of the stuff you were talking there about sort of clarity of purpose. So, mm. I. I you know, I'm sure I went through something similar to other sort of entrepreneurs and business leaders. And, you know, it was like watching a slow car crash happening right in front of you. And mm. It was the fear of the unknown, you know, mm. maybe full lockdown. Uh, are our clients going to de-scope? Uh, what's happening to our prospect list? How, how, am I, how am I people feeling about this? Absolutely. Um, you know, which way is the market going to go? And, mm. you know, you start to see little iterative knocks go that way. And then, you know, a few days where you're licking your wounds and you're trying to sort of digest it all. But then sort of picking yourself back up and say, look, there's, there is positive stuff to come out of this. Mm. Um, and actually, we're not going to lose our bottle on our purpose here. You know, if anything, the future of work and the future of business is coming towards us. Absolutely them. is. Yeah. That's too right much. now, what I need is you to do more of this mm. and do less of that. So that now is boxed off into the parking lot for the time being. Yeah. So those behaviours are non-existent now. This is what I need you to focus on. This yeah. is what you do. So talk to us a bit about your views on that. Yeah, I, I think that these and the don'ts is important. Uh, you know, I, I'm a great believer that sort of as a leader, you don't try and tell everybody how they should do their job. But there are times and there are team members, particularly in times of change and, and crisis, where that becomes does become a bit more important. And again, it's about providing that certainty and structure. Um, so, you know, we know that when you're going through a change, you need to coach people into new ways of working and you need to give them more guidance than you normally would because they're facing problems they haven't faced before or you're asking them to work in a way they haven't worked before. And this environment's absolutely true. So uh, if you just said to everybody from now on, we're just going to work at the end of a, a screen. Um, some individuals will have either done it before or they are sufficiently comfortable. Go, great, got it. And I'll, I'll build my own guidelines around that. There are a whole series of others who will look and think, I've never done this before. Hang on, does that mean I need to be on the whole time? Uh, does that mean that I need to be sitting at my desk 
all the way through the day so that I'm ready every second. Um, what does that mean? Um, and, you know, where should I be focusing? You actually find as a leader, you've got to unpack some of that for them and say, look, look here's what we expect. Um, here's where your freedoms are. And here's where actually I need you to do things in a certain way. Um, and you don't, you can't predict that at the start. It's driven by your team, really, and, and sort of gauging how they're responding to the, the, the crisis as it unfolds. But as a leader, you have to be prepared to do it. And if you're very hands off and you just assume that the team will work things out for themselves, you'll find that you've got a whole load of team members out there who are potentially getting incredibly stressed out by the unknowns and what's expected of them. So just laying out some of those basics. Here's, here's what I expect of you. Here's what I'm really not worried about. But, you know, frankly, I don't care if you turn up in a T-shirt or a shirt. Or I do because that's our business culture. Um, frankly, when we're not on a call, I don't, I'm not worried about how you use your time so long as you get the work done. Or I want us to have a structured day that looks like this so that we're all on the same bit of the problem at the same time. It really doesn't matter what it is as long as it's explained. And, and some of that structure is laid down. And we kind of need to remember as leaders that people look to us for that structure in the first instance. And if we're not providing it, you won't be hearing anything necessarily, but there'll be people out there who are confused and building up stress and really not being certain what is required of them. So I think it's just a little bit more of that, to be honest. So practically, how does that, so if you think about structure and support and mm. arming and giving that sort of um, structure and support that, you know, gets everyone into a, a good state of mind to execute on what the business needs and, and what the individual needs. Talk to me like practical leadership. Practically, training. Yeah. So I think the first thing is setting a rhythm um, and actually being clear what that rhythm is. And, and there won't be a single right rhythm. It'll be hugely different for different businesses, but having some kind of rhythm so that everybody knows when you get together, and when you discuss things. Um, again, it's sort of basic disciplines. It's the same thing you'd want to do in a, in a business pre COVID. But again, in my experience of going to businesses, one of the things that was often very weak when you said to people, okay, when do you meet? And do you meet about sensible things? And is everybody clear when you meet what you're discussing? A huge number of businesses would sort of shuffle their feet a bit and say, well, not really. Even more important now, because you can't correct those errors so easily when you're all miles away from each other. So the first thing I think is to have a rhythm. Um, uh, it could be beginning and end of day. Uh, it could be three times a day. It depends really on, on how collaborative and how closely you're working on the same thing. Um, I think the second one is, it sounds like a, a minor one, but actually is, is just making sure that the face-to-face -face bit is there. So, um, you know, when I think back to uh, some of the businesses that I've worked with and working with now that aren't using um, video fully, that, that, that's missing a huge amount of human interaction. So I would say maximise the video maximize the talking time for, for different members of the team have a way of making sure that every member of the team has a chance to air something so that um you know and don't necessarily make it formulaic try and find ways to get different team members talking without feeling like you're necessarily shoving them in front of the camera so that you get a chance to gauge how everybody is and there will be some team members that aren't comfortable with that so i guess another tip i think in leadership terms is to be prepared to do more one-on-one -on -one work um, but sort of so that you can gauge those team members who are quieter on calls um, and they can come out with things that they don't want to say in front of the rest of the team. Again, it's a standard leadership principle but it becomes even more relevant in this environment. So I think those are some of the things that I'd, I'd highlight. Yeah, I think rhythm's a really interesting point. I mean, we're in week four, I think. I don't know. Feels like it's all blending into one at the moment. You know. that, that's the thing, isn't it? <laughs> I feel like I'm in the Big Brother house or something. Um, yeah. But we're, we're probably on week four and the rhythm's really starting to kick in now. So we, we do a hangout at 8 a.m. Yeah. and a hangout at 6. Yeah. Um, and throughout the day, there's an open Zoom to check in. Certain parts of the business have their own catch ups. Um, you know, we've got, uh, you know, Emma, my EA, she's, she's kind of chief morale officer. <laughs> So, uh, you know, she, she does a weekly survey where we'll check in with everyone to say, you know, how are you feeling? How's it going? How productive are you being? Um, what's your morale like? What more could you be doing to help? You know, so it's kind of there's a reciprocity to the questions. Mm. That's really cool to get sort of real yeah. life back. So some people are more introverted, probably don't feel that they can say on Zoom that they're feeling like something or they're yeah. back. So giving that safe channel too. But I think the rhythm of sort of eight and six is... Um, has really helped us. It's structure, um, isn't it? Yeah, it's just structure, and and, and then the support. We've so I, I look at it sort of like communications and 
So we're communicating regularly. Uh, mm. Last Friday, we went through our cash flow and we went through the performance of the month. And we, we actually kept the structure that we had pre COVID-19. So it was the end of month. Mm -hmm. I report that Kevin did where we just gave everyone complete visualization what was going on yeah. in business helped yeah. it settles people it does just small things like on on um on slack we have you know hashtag results no matter yeah. how small we all love a result you know yeah that's good it that's gone into production or you know one of the sales people might have you know won something that you know is is, is um you know j just boosts morale in people who haven't been through recessions before no. Think there's no business going on well the reality is there are some industries that are booming so, and they want um absolutely they want to change team they they, they want to reach out and, and and ask for help and um and then the other thing was just we we're, we're still we we do a lot of cannibalization in um in our offices in, in london bridge so mm. just using a tool called lean kit which you've probably come across yes yeah, it's been really helpful so um yeah just checking in this is what we're working on. Can we remove the blockers and, you know, sort of servant leadership? We're, 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 yeah. we, we're servant leaders anyway, but I think there's a, an interesting question on that for, for you really, which is if we think about the new style of leadership that's going to come through post COVID-19, do, do you mm -hmm. see servant leadership now becoming pervasive across business in this decade? Or do you think some businesses will revert back to the 1.0 management theatre that, you know, certain, certain individuals and companies just love? It's a really good question, uh, and I think it's a bit too early to tell. I, I mean, some of the, the businesses I'm working with are still adapting, so they haven't caught up yet. Um, and therefore, if things changed in the relatively short term, I've no doubt they would go back to the way they always were. Um, others have already been so heavily impacted that the post-COVID-19 world cannot but be different because they're basically going to start from scratch again. Um, and there's no way they won't have been in, influenced by what's happened. So I think it'll vary by business, and I think it'll also vary depending on how much longer this goes on, yeah. which is a bit of a moving feast. I think we can all recognise. I really hope servant leadership makes a comeback. I think it's, uh, I think there's some moves towards that, both in business and, and sort of politically, socially. I think there's a sort of little bit of social awareness creeping in as a result of what this has exposed about sort of inequality. And, and that, for me, ties back to things like servant leadership. So I hope that it does. Um, I think there are some sort of very big, strong businesses that perhaps aren't particularly servant leadership orientated that will be strong enough to carry on the way they always were. And, you know, some forms of leadership sadly will always be with us. Um, but I'm hoping that for a lot of others, it will. Uh, and this is a golden opportunity. You know, I think there are, there will be people out there in many businesses who are, you know, either new onto the board or at the sort of the middle layers of leadership um, who are the energy of the company's future who will be looking at this and thinking, you know, I can see a different way of doing things. And I would counsel them, now's your time. Uh, yes. There's such a big change going on. Now is the time to put something revolutionary on the table. Now's the time to start campaigning within your business for doing things differently because yeah. everybody's looking for a change and having change forced upon them. There is no better time to be a bit of a revolutionary and to try and change the mentality in your business and drive servant leadership and drive the importance of people than now so you know it could be for those individuals and i know they're out there you work with them i work with them uh, we often try and harness them as change leaders to make businesses better because they're the ones who've got the passion and really want to see things change um now's the time for them i think That'd be fantastic awesome. to see them change from within by a group of hopefully some people listening to this you know got that sort yeah. of business rebel business maverick mindset absolutely I agree you know this is like the biggest cut over from which, whichever way you look at it, most organisations were set up for the last century. Yeah. Optimise for time, activity, um, you know, hierarchy, um, you know, command and controlled, yeah. based, you know, uh, opinions and, and decisions. And now there's a cut over and, and a better world is going to come out of this. And I, I, I'm with you, Rufus. I think it is the unique opportunity that every business now can look at it from a lens even if it's a skunk project to the side, yeah, absolutely. Say, we can reset here, you know, yeah. we can reorganize in a different way and actually we can reinvent. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what I I'm think, really hopeful sorry. for. I was, I was going to say the technology, you know, we talked earlier on about the digital aspect of this. And I think there is a, there's a digital aspect to this, which is allowing us to continue working in a way we never would have been able to do once. Um, and that's telling us something about, you know, what the future of work looks like. 
but there's also, and I would say this, wouldn't I, um, because of my sort of interest, that there's just such a fundamental people element to this, which is just going to come back up the, uh, the agenda again. It is reminding us what's important, uh, as something like a pandemic would. It's ultimately all about people and the threat to people as much as it is about threats to business, more so, frankly. Um, and I think there is an opportunity to just think again and for those mavericks to reinforce the value of the people in an organisation over the value of the process and all the other stuff. Um, and for whatever model comes out at the end of this, to re-emphasise how to use and, and get the most out of those people and give them an inspiring place to work and so on. Yeah, golden opportunity. Yeah, agreed. It's an interesting one actually, talking about people and humans and it was one of the reasons that I left the recruitment world to set up Sullivan Stanley. I just thought the human element had been taken out of resources. It's a real commodity play and it's just not what I got into the business in the first place. Great. I got into this business in the first place to solve problems for execs, um, uh, create opportunities for people like you, connect mm -hmm. and do great stuff in business and kind of leave a bit of an impact. So. I recently was over in a, a really cool conference called Genius Network, held by a guy, okay. Joe Polish. I don't know if you come across him. He's one of the, no. the most connected men in business and a sort of world-class marketeer. So he runs a network called Genius Network, which I'm a part of. And there was um, Peter Diamandes, you've probably heard of. Yes. Um, and Tim Chen, who were doing a talk. And they were saying the future of work, the future of business is human. So it's yeah. not good to be. It's not B to C. It's not B to B to C. It's human to human, yeah. which I thought was which was thought was a really really uh, uh, good statement and actually very yeah. true. What we're going to see in this next decade, companies yeah. are more socially responsible. Companies that are doing well by doing good, yeah. Uh, um, and actually, you know, bringing humans to the fore to let humans do what humans do best, whilst also yeah. letting technology for the good. I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think you know, I reflect on something I mentioned earlier that. You know, if you think back 10 years and say, would I really have been getting personal letters from the CEO of Sainsbury's or Asda about what's happening in their stores 10 years ago? No, you know, the, the, the sharp operators are realising this, that, that actually this is about how, how businesses connect directly um, in the most sort of real and human way possible to the, the communities and the, and the customers they serve. Um, so watch the leaders, as always, watch the leaders and see what they're doing. They're doing that. They're absolutely proving your point. They've worked that out. Um, and I think the businesses that really want to thrive on the back of this um, will be doing that because now everybody has a, has a view about those businesses and everybody has a means of expressing that view to millions of people through social media. Um, and that's a kind of democratisation, actually. It's got a downside to it. We've seen some of the downsides as well, um, but, but it's definitely got an upside from a business point of view. Yeah. So, and it yeah, reinforces the mavericks. And I think when you're talking about the supermarkets um, and CEOs sending a letter, I mean, that, mm -hmm. that's what customers want, right? So customers want to have a love mark uh, and affiliation with the leader of that business. So if you look at, I mean, look, everyone uses example, but it's true. You know, people think of Tesla, they think of Elon Musk, mm -hmm. and they, they get behind what Elon Musk is all about. So they'll buy Tesla products. Mm -hmm. So hopefully through this, some of these big corporates will think, well, actually, our CEO needs to be a lot more visual. Our CEO, you know, Trump, right? I'm not saying that he's you know, <laughs> the uh, epitome of great leadership, but all I'm saying is he's visual. Yeah. So if you think about, there's a real thing there, I think, in clarity and in crisis and, and leadership in crisis. And I think there's visual, visual leadership and, and consistency in comms is, is, is a thing that, 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 that resonates and is true for me. Yeah, I agree. It's interesting. You know, we'll get into another debate, I suspect, at the time over the, over the dangers of cult of personality in that, because you want leaders who are humble at the same time, ideally. Um, yeah. And that can be a bit of a challenge for any leader who's suddenly out in the, out the sort of forefront and, and in the public glare, because they can suddenly build up real sort of delusions of grandeur. Um, but the principle is absolutely right. And, and it's, it is back to that point about being human and the point about what a leader is there to do the stuff we talked about earlier if you have that personal connection with your customers to articulate your purpose um, and to get across what you're trying to do then you're achieving one of your aims as a leader aren't you so and i also think it's uh, think about something else you said um ultimately in, in, in this environment leaders must try and provide as much certainty as they can in uncertainty and so the more they can give people things to hang on to the more they can give them some direction to hang on to some responsibility to hang on to uh, a message to hang on to so that they start to sort of 
push away some of that uncertainty and make people feel like they know which direction they're going and why, um, the better everybody will be, whether you're a customer or a, or a member of the team who's delivering. True. Question for you. So we talked about human to human. Mm. How do you keep things human remotely? I mean, you must have loads of experience with that, with um, you know, orchestrating and leading groups of troops, uh, you know, th through the army right now and, and through the whole of your career. Yeah. How do you? How do we keep things human uh, remotely and, and during times like this? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? And actually, the army is not bad at this, despite the fact it's a very formal organisation. Um, by allowing yourself to be human in the first instance. So um, actually, you know, I don't know about you, but I've certainly found in meetings just having a little bit more time, either at the front or the back, to have those conversations about how the weekend was or what you got up to last night or whether the kids are driving you mad, um, which normally would be, you know, seen as sort of pre-meeting stuff. Um, actually, you need to allow some of that in. So let people remind each other that they're human and find connections other than work. Um, and as a leader, not being afraid to be human. Um, and, that, and I mean that both in terms of letting your personality come out rather than being really formal all the time. Um, but also being more willing to admit when you're getting it sort of get, getting it wrong and, and asking for views from the team as well. So that you can show you're not this remote figure, but you are somebody who can, um, the team can have a conversation with and that you are harnessing a group effort um, and accepting views, not just always laying down the law. So really it's about just being human. Uh, and I think there's a kind of leadership model out there which says that a good leader is somewhat sort of superhuman. Um, you know, the hero culture, the leader can do everything and always knows the answer and always has the direction, always has all these wonderful things. And if you want to make things more human, you need to show that's not quite true and that as a leader, you know, you have responsibility and you recognize that and you'll do those things we've talked about, but you are also, um, up for an exchange and, and sometimes make mistakes and, and need guidance from the team as much as they need guidance from you. Um, I think those are the, the, at the heart of it, really. Just be a human leader. Be authentic. Yeah. It's a neat one, isn't it? It's about being authentic, showing up as an authentic leader. But, you know, during times like this, we're carrying a lot of emotions. We're mm. you know, carrying a lot of people's different sort of wants and needs and... Um, different people have got different tolerations to being isolated or not having yeah. human contact. So how do you recognize and empathize and deal with the fact that you know, we're all fallible, right? Rufus, all humans that yeah. make us an interesting species. So, and, and that's what makes leadership sometimes quite hard is you know, orchestrating and, you don't... and getting the best out of a group of people in an authentic and, and human way. Yeah, I think you don't, for the start, don't hide it. I mean, yeah. I, I suspect you found the same. Many people listening to this will have um, had the same as they're working remotely. You'll, you'll have up days and down days. There, there'll be a day when you're talking to the team and everybody's buzzing and the conversation starts well and people are feeling energised. And you'll have a day when, when everybody's flat and actually the conversation's a bit more difficult and everybody's a little bit disconnected and so on. And as a leader, you want to do your bit to try and um, build up a team and inject that enthusiasm, but also... Sometimes you just need to recognize and accept that there are up days and there are down days. Um, and it helps in some ways to call them out because you recognize that then they're a passing thing. So uh, we had that last week with my team. We definitely had a down day. We're all sitting around low energy um, and just going out and saying, you know, we're, we're having one of those days, aren't we? It's, you know, it's a little bit tougher today. We're all so a, a little bit warm, um, but a good night's sleep and we'll be back on again. Just recognizing that that can happen and that it's human and it's not the end of the world because each person will be sitting there thinking, well, this feels a bit awkward. It's tough today, isn't it? Um, and that's not that, that, that feeling can grow if you're not careful, if you call it out and, set, and, and get it on the table. So everybody knows it's there. Um, actually it's a stress reliever and there might be for one or two of those individuals, a reason why it's a down day. And if you call it out, they might tell you why and you might actually then get into being able to solve a problem that means tomorrow won't be a down day. So, so yeah, I think my conclusion to that would be just be open and honest about it. Don't try and bulldoze through as if it's not there. Because that's the one way you ensure that it'll be back again tomorrow and the day after. Fantastic. Got two questions for you. Mm. Uh, so we've talked a lot about clarity and crisis. We've covered the situation that we're all in right now. Um, you know, a lot of people will be listening to this and be looking at how they can 
adopt some of the things that we've spoken about when you do those kind of things what i found and what you know and what you found i'm sure is you start to settle groups of people yes. and get focused on the right thing create a moment of calm or a, more than a moment of calm a, a rhythm of calmness um, mm. to give them that sort of top end support so we're in that world now you mentioned something that was really interesting i just wanted to ask you a question just get a bit more sort of um, meat around it if you like which was mm. campaigning for change within a business mm. So talk to me a bit more like that. So the reality is a lot of businesses will probably try and get back to as normal as quickly as possible and they will slowly but surely revert to type. But there's going to be lots of business mavericks out there that will be listening to this or will want to campaign for change of the yeah. new world that they can see now. And there's their, mm. that's, that was their opportunity. Talk to me about campaigning for change and, and uh, some tips around that. Well, let, let, let's start with the, um, the adage that people hate change. And um, I think most of us in the change management business always sort of react to that and say, no, people love change. They, they just want to be involved in delivering it rather than have it thrust upon them. And right now, uh, they are, I'm seeing, I'm sure you're seeing it, there are a whole load of people more than ever who can see because of that stress testing, because of all the weaknesses that have been exposed in their business models, those people who are already dissatisfied with the way their business worked and believe that their businesses could work better are, are, are getting more and more sort of ammunition and evidence that the change should come. And in some cases, probably getting really, really frustrated if the business isn't using this opportunity to change. So I think my advice to some of those people, first and foremost, would be um, to, to gather that evidence. Gather this, gather what this is showing you. There's this kind of rich tapestry of proof that your business needs to be different and that um, that the people in the business need to matter more or that the operating model needs to change gather some of it because uh, we all know them the, the best evidence if you want to persuade a board to change is to show them in, un, in controversial terms what's wrong show them where things are failing um, as, the, as the start towards a business case or whatever um, so gather the evidence of proof um, and B, start talking about change. Um, I think that, that having that discussion with your teams, if we're all sitting down twice a day doing catch-ups and in other meetings with our teams, um, as you and I are now, um, and you talk about the business of the day, then just insert towards the back end of those discussions, um, you know, this is an opportunity when this is all over to do something different and start that conversation going so that people already get in their mind's eye the fact that when this starts to ease up, what we're not going to do is just reinstitute the old model. But when we've got the capacity and the headspace, we are going to institute a new model, something different. If you start that swell for it now and start the conversation now, um, it's very hard at the end of this then to just set it aside and go back to the old model. If you just keep your powder dry on that and say, when this is all easier, um, then I'll raise it. Um, the chances of going back to what you're doing before are significantly increased. So, um, you know, without being um, difficult about it, in a constructive way, I would say to those mavericks out there, start feeding it into the conversation, just at the back end. When we finish, we should. Yeah. We ought to consider. And some of that you'll be able to do now, actually. you build enough of a swell and they say, well, why, don't, why are we waiting to this? Why don't we, next yeah. week, why don't we try that? Uh, start having a conversation about change and leading from, leading from the middle, leading from the floor. Yeah. yeah, this reminds me of a quote I heard the other day, which I loved. When it's time for change, it's time to change. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it reminds me of something else you said, which I loved, which was extreme change. You mentioned extreme extreme change earlier on in this podcast, and if you think yeah. about the context of extreme ownership and mm. some of the great uh, management and leadership principles we we can get from the Navy SEALs and um, yeah. you know, Army. Talk about extreme change because we're going through extreme extreme change now. Yeah. Uh, how can how can that be embedded now into organisations to uh, really what what I feel and I've been talking about this for since sort of 2015 that the businesses that will win are ones that are change ready and change adaptive. Like they have to have change at the heart of their agenda. Yeah. You know, they're not just tech organisations or they're not just an organisation that serves this company. They're a change organisation. No. So how can companies go from this? Oh, extreme change situation which is probably the most ex the extreme business situation we'll all face potentially yeah. hopefully um how do they now embed that for it to be sustainable for the foreseeable so they can thrive in this decade 
<laughs> that's interesting actually and, and i'm going to bring us back to clarity again one of the things the military does is designed to go and operate anywhere and, and do almost anything you know uh, that's the whole point is we're going to train a group of people to have a generic set of skills which we can then apply to lots of things and we don't really know what we're going to ask you to apply it to just be ready um, and what the military does to enable that is it has um, real simplicity and clarity about purpose and, and, and responsibility and priority. Um, that's how it works. So that essentially each person knows broadly what their sort of role is in a generic sense, and it can be applied to anything. So um, it, I think part of the challenge here is, is bringing that into business a little bit more and creating uh, extreme ownership is, is capable you know you're capable of having extreme ownership if you've got that clarity um, and we all know that work flows to the people who can do it so i think what businesses need to be able to do is focus on how do i build some really clear and simple um, structures and responsibilities and purpose for my teams and then scythe the way all of this other noise um, some of which you know is, is legal compliance and so on but a lot of which is just sludge an awful lot of businesses, uh, particularly the bigger they are, the longer they run, they build up sludge of process, sludge of governance, sludge of, um, of noise, frankly, which just holds everybody down. What we've got an opportunity to do here is scythe away a lot of that and focus back on the basics. And if you've got a core team who understand the basics really well and have got some form of clear ownership based around clear responsibilities and a clear set of priorities, you can launch teams like that at pretty much anything and they will respond. Um, and if you look at any organization that operates in uncertainty the whole time, that's what drives them, is those simplicities and clarities, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I hope we see a lot more of that. I mean, I think it's gonna happen naturally. Some of that, that sludge is going to be washed away by working this way and by um, the stress testing of the businesses that's gone on. Um, but I think individuals can help that a little further by pointing out the bits that don't work and the bits that are just holding them back. And, and washing away even more of it. And then you can exercise extreme leadership. And if you can exercise extreme leadership, you can cope with change and you can respond to it much faster than everybody else can. Amazing. Um, definitely one last thing. Um, yeah. What signposts have you got for our listeners about key learnings in these areas? It might be books, it might be podcasts, it, just signposts for people to spread, spread the word, spread the learning. Um, Oh, it's a good question. Um, on the spot there. <laughs> I, just... I always like, um, uh, it's, it's uh, quite old now, but um, Stanley McChrystal, um, who, was a, who was an American Special Forces general who led in Afghanistan, um, team of teams. He, but, but in fact, almost anything done by him, he writes some really good stuff about leadership um, and leadership in crisis and leadership in times of challenge. So I think that's always worth a read. Um, but I also think, the, 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 it's less about what to read, but places to look. I think the, the places to look for good examples of how to operate in this kind of uncertainty are looking at people who do it all the time. So, you know, the military is quite good and everybody defaults to the military, but actually looking at um, charities that operate in tough environments. Um, so, you know, people like Medicine and Science Frontier and others give some really good examples of how teams can cope with uncertainty and operating in difficult environments. Um, so I think it's thinking a little bit laterally about where you get your leadership examples from. Um, we tend to um, sort of laud the business leaders who have made huge profits and created huge growth in their businesses. Um, a number of those business leaders have had their tarnish rubbed off quite heavily over the last month or so. Um, so I think we want to find some better leadership models, frankly. Um, and I would suggest looking in some of those places for it, some of the extreme charity sectors and, and people who work in, in places of uncertainty for their examples of, of good leadership. Fantastic. Rufus, I just wanted to say uh, many thanks. I really enjoyed this. Um, pleasure. Good fun. Well, we could have cracked on for another hour, but I try and keep this to sort of 45 to 50 minutes for gym gym time and uh, and driving yeah. time so um yeah no uh, been a pleasure to to talk to you and, and glad this is the first episode i have to say yeah, but my pleasure it's been real fun really enjoyed it pat yeah me too me too and i'm sure we'll be collaborating on something uh, again soon and i look forward to that later on this year um, okay and I, yeah. I think i just finished with the uh, i suspect we both would with the message to all those mavericks out there take yeah. the opportunity go and do it
and then shake things up. And it's time for change. Yeah, do right. <laughs> Brilliant. Top man. And keep well and stay safe, Rufus. And do. Thanks, Pat. Take care. All the best. Bye. Bye-bye.